the universal energy field. Introduction The universal energy field pervades the universe. It surrounds everything, plants, animals, and humans. As we saw in our video the symbolism of the ocean and sea. We cannot perceive this using our five senses, and indeed the only people able to perceive its structure are clairvoyants. Humans, plants and animals are surrounded by this field, and waves of energy rush towards us, but also flow back like ripples in a pond, taking our thoughts with them. The waves that flow to the shore of our bodies are both used by our bodies as the source of power, but also create our physical body. The waves and chakras. The field supplies power via our chakras. The energy pours in through the core of the chakra, reaches the spine via its stalk, then flows along the tiny pathways which are connected with the physical nervous system. It finally returns to the chakras, moving outward in spirals through the periphery of the petals, in a constant intake and outflow. There is thus a connection between the aura, which is essentially spiritual, and the physical body. Something we explore in our video the concept of the aura and the symbol of the island. The chakras are sometimes compared to flowers, in that to a clairvoyant's eye. They appear to have layered petals, but really these are actually smaller vortices. See our video the symbolism of chakras and flowers. There seems to be some discussion on the spin direction. Some believe the chakras spin in a clockwise direction in order to release energy out of the body, and spin in an anti-clockwise direction in order to pull energy from the external world into our being. Others say the direction of spin depends on the frequency of chakric vibrations. But a weak or non-spinning chakra indicates a blockage. The chakras also reveal a person's quality of consciousness and degree of personal development and abilities. In a simple, rather undeveloped person, the chakras will be small in size, slow in movement, dull in color and coarse in texture. In a more intelligent, responsive and sensitive person they will be brighter, of finer texture and with a more rapid movement. And in an awakened individual who makes full use of his powers, they become coruscating whirlpools of color and light. The various levels of the aura. If we take Mrs. Dora Van Gelder Coombs as our source, the aura can only be perceived by a clairvoyant. Furthermore, if we use her book, The Personal Aura, the levels of the aura were not seen by her. As some orderly progress of physical layers like the layers of an onion. In fact, the paintings she commissioned all show very complex patterns that provided Dora with the ability to heal, but would have meant nothing to anyone else. And her experiences in healing were only phrased in the sort of terms Fritz Joff Capra used and described in the video the concept of the template and Indra's net. Yet there are those who state the aura is glared and even describe the layers. There are numerous pictures on the internet attempting to show these layers, even to the extent of giving them apparently physical boundaries. But they are not physical. They are spiritual, functions or activities only seen through clairvoyance, like a biblical vision. The fact that we can discern chakras and their activity via pendulums has deluded us into thinking the layers themselves are physical. But all these images and pictures are just like any vision, the clairvoyant has to portray them before they can be seen by anyone else. You will never physically find the astral layer, for example, because it only exists in the mind of the clairvoyant. Indeed, it tells us nothing about what the astral layer is or does. So we will turn to a different diagram that avoids the trap of diagrammatically showing these as physical layers. The levels as functions, 
reintroducing the data flow diagram. This is a data flow diagram. This diagram shows the interaction and dependency of one function upon others for data and information. The physical body is not shown. This diagram shows only spirit. The diagrammatic conventions are light blue boxes. Functions, what happens, are in light blue square or rectangular boxes, for example, learn, recall memories from memory, reason and exercise the will, and thus direct the next course of action. We can have emotions and perceive. We also include the functions of all the five senses. The function of the nervous system that transfers sensations inside the body, and systems that are bodily functions, but happen without the intervention of the will, so-called autonomic systems. The higher spirit is a group of functions that includes the composer of dreams and spiritual experiences. Yellow boxes. Light yellow boxes are data or information. The arrows indicate which function creates the data and which functions use the data. So, for example, memory is information or data and is used by the function of memory recall to create memories, which are, in turn, used by the system which directs our next course of action, to decide what to do next and which are used by the system of emotions to create an emotion. Red box. The dark red box also describes information, but although it may be called perceptions, the output of having perceived, this information may also be called a thought. It is also used by numerous functions, to learn, to trigger an emotion, to decide directly an almost instantaneous course of action. Dark blue box. It is used by the higher spirit to provide help, thus the higher spirit will examine your thoughts, red line linking thoughts to higher spirit. Decide what is needed, and here it may ask for help from other spirit entities, dark yellow, or gather more data from other sources. And then use the composer to provide appropriate help, so-called spiritual input. Note that both thoughts and spiritual input are handled by the perceived function, in effect at our subconscious level. Example. So maybe we are writing a book and we have up until a certain point used our memory to direct our course of action. But then we get stuck and decide to have a rest and think about it. The thoughts reach our higher spirit, the higher spirit looks around for data that matches our need and the composer creates an answer. And our subconscious receives the inspiration it was searching for. The correlation between data flow diagram and the levels. The etheric level. To the clairvoyant, the etheric body looks like a luminous web of fine bright lines of force. The etheric level represents the physical body, muscles, tissues, bones, and so on. And the clairvoyant is seeing the sensations. Emotional layer. This layer represents emotions and feelings both the function and data and information generated. To a clairvoyant, the spiritual picture can be all colors of the rainbow or can be muddy colored during times of emotional stress. As we can see from the diagram, emotions affect everything. They fill our thoughts, affect our direction system, get stored in memory and can be recalled. We learn by assessing the strength of emotion attached to an experience. Over the years, humanity has produced a great deal of smog or debris in the emotional atmosphere. Our idea of a rational mind is fictional, because our mind is constantly connected with our emotions. The emotions feed back and affect our health. Show a child frightening images and the memory will live with them affecting their actions and their health. But show a child images that are kind and safe. Which move them with their beauty or are noble and uplifting. And the child's actions will reflect this and their health be more robust. A sensitive, trusting, warm and loving person may also become the victim of other people's emotional disturbances. 
As such we would do well to protect the vulnerable from the people who are themselves damaged. Mental layer. The next layer is called the mental layer. All the functions and data of the conscious mind, learning, memory, memory recall, reasoning and the will form the mental layer. And as we can see, there are aspects of the mind that play a major part in deciding what we do next. The objectives, desires and obligations. The personality and its ego. Astral layer. The conscious and unconscious mind together form the mortal souls. Functionally we then soar up to the higher spirit and come in contact with our immortal soul, the one which survives death. The astral layer describes all our spiritual attachments to other spirit entities. These may be bodied thus normally living, or formerly bodied and thus dead, or entities that have only ever been spirit, for example, angels. They become part of a team or a totem group of spirits that our higher spirit can call on and ask for help. Fifth layer, etheric template. The template used to mend and heal the body. The higher spirit thus has the entire blueprint of what the body should look like. Sixth layer, celestial. Where unconditional love and feelings of oneness flow and can be healed with unconditional love. When strong, the person themselves may have the ability to communicate with the spirit world and receive angelic messages. Seventh layer, Ketheric template, represents the feeling of being one with the universe. This level is connected to the crown chakra and can be seen by the clairvoyant as gold in color. The mortal soul, emotion and health. It should be much clearer from this diagram that our mortal soul its health and well-being is fundamentally affected by our emotions. Indeed, one could argue that we are emotional creatures, slightly affected by a rational mind. And the weaker the rational mind, the more likely chronic disturbances on the emotional level, such as continuous hostility or anxiety, fear and depression will eventually damage the whole system. And we can see that anything that produces positive emotions that will be beneficial for our health, and one way is through stories and myths. The need for myth, the good guy, as we perceive it, does not always win. Innocent and good people can die, life can seem unfair, even cruel. We create the world we live in. It is no use blaming God, it is men we have to blame for all of life's ills. Men make war, men build houses that collapse during earthquakes. Men are cruel to animals and their fellow humans. Men steal from their fellow men, men build houses on land that floods. Build their homes near volcanoes. And over fault lines. We are a flawed species when we look at our rational selves, never anticipating failure. Never able to work out the effects and consequences of our actions. Victims of our own incompetence, often only motivated by money. And we are being constantly reminded of just how dangerous and incompetent we are. Climate change, nuclear disasters, medical errors and failures. Our emotions, the fear and depression these all create, could easily kill us. But a myth or story can divert us, when the underdog always wins, when wonder and magic can divert us and fill us with joy. Joseph Campbell, from the hero with a thousand faces. It would not be too much to say that myth is the secret opening through which the inexhaustible energies of the cosmos pour into human cultural manifestation. Religion, philosophies, arts, the social forms of primitive and historic man, prime discoveries in science and technology, the very dreams that blister sleep, boil up from the basic magic ring of myth. Once upon a time in a dull brown world, the stained glass windows of cathedrals filled us with awe, and the beauty of cathedrals soaring to heaven, the voices of choir boys. Or festivals such as Diwali. 
India's Festival of Light. But now we have films like Lord of the Rings, Star Trek, Star Wars, and Harry Potter where there is a hero who wins. Despite the fact he is generally a David to the Goliath of what he is up against. And we even have heroes who are young girls. The book His Dark Materials by Sir Philip Pullman has a heroine, Lyra, who is both brave and resourceful. A role model for every girl, just as George was in Enid Blyton's famous five books. We even have interesting pairings of heroes, the young boy Elliot who befriends, E.T., the extraterrestrial. In each case, there is an often veiled villain representing the physical reality that we have every reason to want to rebel against. So myths can subconsciously alert us to actual dangers. In Jurassic Park, for example, we are being warned against genetic modification. In the movie Matrix, the warning is against artificial intelligence. and against those who create it. Fantasy narratives do not need to be scientifically possible. Authors have to rely on the reader's suspension of disbelief and an acceptance of the unbelievable or impossible. For the sake of enjoyment, there should be heavy reliance on the supernatural and magic. In the film Narnia, the fantasy world created by C.S. Lewis, the portal to the world is a wardrobe. Some animals talk, and mythical beasts abound, and magic is common. And in the movie The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, which is both a film and book by L. Frank Baum, Dorothy ends up in the magical land of Oz, after she and her pet dog Toto are swept away from their home by a cyclone, and her companions there are a straw man, a tin man and a lion. And lest you should think this is a Western phenomenon, Heiro Miyazaki is a Japanese animator, filmmaker, and manga artist and co-founder of Studio Ghibli. He created Castle in the Sky, 1986, My Neighbor Totoro, 1988, Kiki's Delivery Service, 1989, and Porco Rosso, 1992. Spirited Away became the highest grossing film in Japanese history, winning the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, and is frequently ranked among the greatest films of the 21st century. As such, myths have a role in feeding our emotional selves, whilst, at the same time, showing us the dangers of the world we are creating. And, without preaching, hint at the ways in which we can counteract these dangers.